Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Um, good afternoon. Good to see you guys. So we just have a couple moments, and then we'll get started for today's uh, Wednesday, March 24th meeting. Hope you're having a good week over there, and uh, I'll be right with you guys. <laughs> Hi, Brenda, Chelsea, Ashley, Nayeli. It's always good to see you guys. Hi there, Danny, <clears throat> Nancy, Emily, Margarita, Noah. Nice. Okay. <clears throat> Hi, Nick, Vanessa. Danny, Edward, welcome everybody. <clears throat> Megan, don't forget you. <clears throat> hey Mick, Dylan, Yvonne, great. Okay, so welcome back everybody. Good to see you guys as usual. Um, it's pretty much one, so let's get things underway. Today, as you guys know, it's our last class meeting until we um, come back from spring break. Um, so what we're basically doing today is we're just going to finish off the last couple of fallacies in the topic of unwarranted assumption fallacies. And then after that, um, we'll maybe do a little bit of review of all the different fallacies that we've learned about. We'll see how much time that takes us. And then from there, we'll be good to go. And you guys can have a great spring break. Hopefully, um, have a nice, safe, healthy spring break. Um, whatever you guys are planning to do. I'm sure a lot of us are just locked down and quarantined, but whatever the plan you may have, uh, wishing you the best. So, okay, let's just keep it moving. And of course, as usual, if you have any kind of um, questions, comments, or anything else, let it be put in the chat and I'll take whatever you guys have. Um, and do leave behind some kind of comment at some point just for your um, attendance record, and that'll be great. Okay, so, Cool, let's just take measure of what we were doing last time. Last time we finished off the um, red herring fallacy from fallacies of relevance, and then we started to branch into the fallacies of unwarranted assumption. Um, so that's the third and last category of fallacies that we're studying in chapter five. Fallacies of unwarranted assumption are basically a grouping of fallacies which have this feature in common. They all include assumptions that are not supported by the available evidence. So they're all problematic because of some assumption that is not reasonable or fair for a person to make when they make such an argument. So in the category, there's begging the question, inappropriate appeal to authority, loaded question, false dilemma, and then the three more that we didn't get to last time, which we'll cover today, questionable cause, slippery slope, and then naturalistic fallacy. Okay, so that's our major goal to finish those three for sure. Before we get into them though, um, I'll ask you a couple questions just to help us review the things that we studied in the last lecture. So let's talk about begging the question first of all. Um, who thinks they could tell me anything about that fallacy? What is begging the question and how does that exactly, um, what's the definition of the fallacy begging the question? Let's see if anyone can tell me this and then we'll go from there. <clears throat> Begging the question. Hi there, everyone. Cecilia, Stacy, J, Sophia, Tahani, Alexa. Welcome back. Dimitri, Derek, and all the rest. Ray. Um, but here's my question. See if you can answer that. Okay, Margarito. When you just reword a premise in the conclusion. Okay, pretty much. When when one of the premises of the argument. It's just a slightly reworded version of the conclusion, yes. That's not a good argument because that's an argument which goes in a circle. It's an argument which has a claim, but when you ask what is the defense of the claim, the person says the claim itself. Like if I told you aliens exist and you say why, because I'm like, because they don't not exist, I mean that would not be a good argument because it would just be saying the same thing in maybe slightly changed language, but it's still equivalent information. Okay, so that's right. Can anybody give an example perhaps? of like a begging the question fallacy. Let me see if you can run one of those off. So <clears throat> here's a one way to kind of generate such an example if you're a little stumped or if you want some help. Just try to like include a word or phrase that is a more 
clear definition of another word that appears in the conclusion, right? So like if the conclusion says abortion, then one premise can say like terminating a pregnancy. Or if the conclusion says something about, um, I don't know, um, let me think of another good example, like a, a car accident, then one of the premises can say like a vehicular uh, crash, right? So, so let me think, or rather you can think and tell me if you can come up with such an example. Because um, the quiz that we will have when we return from spring break, one element of it might be to give a few examples. If I ask you for you know, a given kind of fallacy, then you can supply an example. So maybe if we get a few of these examples here, we'll be good to go and that'll help a little bit. Maybe someone can throw one out there and let's see what you have. <clears throat> so, you know, uh, write it in whatever format you want. You know, I know it's not so easy to give standard form on the live chat, but you can number premises or just write them in whatever order as long as it's clear enough for me to interpret it. So what do you think if we have an example of begging the question? <clears throat> It's okay to take a moment, but you'll get it. So let me know when you're ready. Begging the question. <clears throat> Maybe if I think of uh, some suggestion, I can feed it to you as you're doing your work right now. Um, <clears throat> okay, how about this? Um, what if I have a circular argument, a begging the question argument, and the conclusion of the argument is that it's wrong to steal? Okay, so can you make a fallacious argument with that conclusion? Okay, well, let me talk about your example, Chelsea, and maybe someone else will think of the one I just mentioned. Chelsea, smoking cigarettes can kill you because cigarettes are deadly. There you go, that is a good example. So the conclusion of your argument is that cigarettes can kill you, which is a true point. Of course, they can kill you, but what's the evidence of the example argument that you gave? The evidence, the premise, is just cigarettes are deadly. So it basically says cigarettes you know, are deadly because cigarettes are deadly. Um, if you wanted to make an argument that cigarettes are deadly, you could certainly make a reasonable one. You know, you could say um, they contain carcinogens. Those are known to induce um, cancerous growths. And since they have that kind of carcinogenic property, they're deadly, therefore. Um, but that would be a different argument, which doesn't just repeat the point of the conclusion. So that's a great example, Chelsea. Margarito, you're saying that in my last question, suppose the conclusion is that stealing is wrong. Then you're saying because or stealing is immoral. Unmoral, a bit of an awkward phrase. Usually we say immoral. Um, yeah, Danny, you could also have changed the definition, or not definition, but the wording of the act of stealing. So taking property from others that they haven't given you is bad, therefore stealing is wrong. Um, that's just saying that it's wrong because it's wrong. Okay, so good examples, guys. I'm glad that I could just get a little bit of support from you as I go through the uh, topics. So let's continue from there. What is the inappropriate appeal to authority? Who can tell me this? So the second of the unwarranted assumption fallacies, the um, inappropriate appeal to authority, easy enough, I think, to explain or describe it, but what is it, according to you? <clears throat> Just take a moment, collect your thoughts, but then let's see it. Okay, Chelsea, so we appeal to the opinion of an authority to gain support for your claim, but the problem is this person is not an authority on the subject. Correct, and also correct, Margarito, yes. So that's what appeal to, um, inappropriate appeal to authority is. What can you think of as an example of that? Anybody? We see the definition, put it into action, put it, uh, apply it to a case. What, for example, is um, an appeal to authority fallacy? <clears throat> I could probably give you a few as we're talking about it, so collect your thoughts, put it in the chat, but um, <clears throat> maybe you know, you're like, my auto mechanic was telling me not to get vaccinated because he heard, that, you know, he told me that they're really dangerous, vaccines are. Uh, well, that person is, you know, like an expert, I guess, on automotive repair, and they could probably tell you all the things that go into, you know, having an internal combustion engine and stuff but I'm not the first person perhaps to talk to about the efficacy of vaccines and other um, man-made interventions into you know, 
medical science. So that would be one example. Margarito, um, asking a plumber why your head hurts. Sure. So like um, I was talking to, um, I don't know, my, I don't want to pick on people's professions. There's nothing wrong with being a plumber. There's nothing wrong with being a car auto, you know, repair guy or whatever. Uh, the issue is simply that you're outside of your field of expertise. So it could be like I talked to my English professor um, and my English professor told me don't invest in um, Bitcoin or something because it's just going to bring a bubble that bursts. Well, unless you already know that this English professor who's definitely a skilled master of the worlds of literature and um, the written word, how is that person necessarily the expert authority that you would consult on financial planning or investment advice? So, you know, we should be able to rely on authoritative expertise, but not in a field where the person can't claim that expertise. That would be inappropriate appeal to authority. Okay, so then there's loaded question. Maybe someone could tell me about this, the loaded question concept. What is that fallacy? Let's start with the definition and then we'll have some brief commentary after that. <clears throat> So let me know. <clears throat> okay, good, Kenya. So that is, you ask a question, but the question is loaded because it assumes an answer to other information that you just don't know. And so it assumes the answer to a different unasked question. So let's see. How about uh, ask, an, ask a loaded question? This one, maybe you got thoughts and ideas. Uh, so let me see if you can come up with some of these. Anybody here, put a loaded question in the chat. <clears throat> Did you pass your driver's test? Okay, good. I guess what's the loaded assumption of that question? That the person has taken the driver's test. And the only question is, did they pass or fail it? But maybe a person has never even yet taken the test. And if you don't know that much about them, then this could be seen as a loaded question. Sure. Did you fail the calculus test? Well, okay. But now, Margarito, I think, you, you know, I, I was going to indulge Danny's example. But then now I'm seeing another one that's a little bit too similar to it. And I think that I maybe there's some misunderstanding. Because I think, Margarito, you're giving an example of someone who you know took the test. Because when you added the second comment, you're like, that can infer that the person is either smart or dumb. But if we don't, if we already know that they took the test, then this is a reasonable question. Because did you fail is a yes or no question. Um, so there has to be something that, that is assumed that is not known to the question asker. Like, okay, hey, what's wrong? Assuming something's wrong. Interesting, Nick. That's borrowing from one of my examples, though. How about you come up with something on your own? Let's get another one in there. But we're off to a decent start. Um, I think we can have clearer examples too. <clears throat> yeah, no, it's not to completely off Margarito. I was just trying to point out that um, if we're in the class with the person, which is I think the basis that you would ask such a question, then you're already in a position to know that they at least took the test. So there's no real assumption there. You're not assuming they failed or that they didn't. You're just asking. So let's continue, but I want another example though. <clears throat> How many different um, illegal drugs have you guys taken? <clears throat> How bad was your last hangover? What's the loaded question I'm asking you? Do you kind of get what I'm saying? So if you have the idea, then give me something else that's along the same lines. Ask a question in that genre. <clears throat> Or should I pause because you didn't understand my example? Okay, so if I ask somebody, when's the last time you had a hangover? How is that a loaded question? What's being assumed in that question? <clears throat> like if I ask you that, I think it is a loaded question because I really don't know you and how you live your life per se, except that you're my student. Um, what Pokemon cards do you have? Okay, fine, there you go, Danny. Assuming the person plays Pokemon and that they actually collect the cards, that might be an assumption that you don't really know. Chelsea, did he hit you again? Um, well, look, the way you phrase your question though, Chelsea, it's not a proper example either though, because the word again is part of your question. So that implies that you have knowledge that the person has hit them before. And if you do know that, then there's nothing that's been assumed. Rather, the question is just an open question. Is this happened again? So, I mean, you could have said something like, how many times have you been uh, abused in a relationship? How many different partners have you had that have 
uh, hurt you or like what kind of abuse have you experienced by a partner? That could be a loaded question because maybe someone's never had an abusive relationship so they can't really open up about which kind of abuse. So these are examples. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys. I really thought that I would get a bigger wave of suggestions though because this is one that's kind of like I think an easy one. But anyway, keep being active and keep submitting your responses to my questions. Okay, so one more though, false dilemma. What is the false dilemma fallacy? <clears throat> one more and then we are on to some new, um, well three more concepts from there. So let's get the false dilemma back on the table. <clears throat> I mean, while you're doing that, I'll keep hitting you with loaded questions. What kind of car do you drive? Where do you work? These are perhaps loaded questions if I, the professor, ask you, the student, because I don't even know if you have a car. Um, and I'm not even sure if you have a job. So that could be loaded question. But anyway, keep going. So what's false dilemma? <clears throat> False dilemma. Okay, Chelsea, so a person reduces the responses to a complex issue to a binary either or um, choice. You could have added that either or, but that's pretty well clear. So that is how false dilemma goes. A person is um, saying that something where there's more than two options, like they're making it seem like there's only two. So um, I don't know, how about this? Um, what do you like, what's your favorite soda? Is it Coke or Pepsi? Now, how could that be a false dilemma? If I put the question to you like that, Coke or Pepsi, which one is your favorite? Let me make sure you understand the concept by giving me my answer. So why is that a um, false dilemma? Well, because there are other brands of soda. Yes, that's right. So it's possible that a person may say, no, I mean, you're limiting me to two choices, but there's clearly not just those only two options. I mean, those are obviously two of the most well-known brands, but they might like other styles like uh, me. I'm a fan of uh, Dr. Pepper if I had to choose you know, soda. So I would have to give the person a different uh, type of answer than just going with the two that they've given. So I don't know. And you can think of similar examples. Um, you know, do you um, identify as straight or gay? You know, what is your sexual orientation? You can say that's a false dilemma because there's more than two possible orientations, let's say. Um, maybe we could go with the example of, um, I don't know, like, are you in the workforce or do you go to school? Um, I'm posing these as questions. I guess they could also be seen as assertions, like someone's either in school or they work, and I know this guy doesn't have a job, so he must be a student. That would be a false dilemma because obviously some people are unemployed and they're not going to school. So, you know, that's like neither one. Okay, guys, so we always have to make sure that we don't limit ourselves to two possibilities when there's more than two. And we also don't want to get put on the spot by people who sometimes try to frame questions or arguments as though there's simply two choices or binary options when in fact there may be more than those. Okay, so those would be all false dilemma. So now there's just three more of these. Uh, fallacies of unwarranted assumption to finish off the topic of fallacies. So next one we have is this questionable cause Okay, so the questionable cause fallacy, what's that all about? Well, it's simply when we assume without good evidence when we assume without good evidence that one thing is the cause of another thing Okay, so <clears throat> Questionable cause. When we assume without good evidence that one thing is the cause of another. Um, <clears throat> so sometimes this is called in Latin by another name, just so that you know that. It's sometimes referred to as post hoc, post hoc fallacy. 
And uh, they sometimes call it post hoc, or there's even a full title, post hoc ergo propter hoc. But post hoc means after the fact. So the questionable cause dilemma oftentimes involves a person noting that here event A happened before event B just in time, and then falsely ass assuming that since A happened before B, that it therefore has to be the cause of B. And that's just not necessarily the case, you know, like I was born back in the 80s, and um, sometime later in 2020, the coronavirus, you know, exploded around the world. So am I the cause because I was born before that? No. I mean, that's two unrelated events. One thing happened first, the other thing happened second, but there's more to cause and effect than just the order of the events in time, you see? So um, like you enrolled in this class and then yesterday we had this, or a couple days ago we had a mass shooting, but you're not the cause of that mass shooting, right? Just because that happened before it. So sometimes though people make this questionable assessment that something's the cause of something else. Oftentimes it has to do with superstitious type of beliefs of cause and effect. Okay, so like uh, imagine this, someone's just walking down the street, you know, having a walk, and what do you know, a black cat just walk, crosses in front of them from out of the alley. Okay, so the black cat crosses their path as they're walking. Now suppose that later on that same day, a big heavy tree branch falls on their car where they were parked and causes a big dent and some damage to the hood. So now suppose that this person has a little bit of a superstitious way of thinking and they then claim that what was the cause? What caused the little incident with the car and the damage? If you're following the example, what do you think I'm suggesting would be the fallacious uh, questionable cause here? <clears throat> the black cat, right? They say a black cat's bad luck even though they're great animals and I have friends that own really adorable black cats. But anyway, um, and you know, I think it's true, like adoption and stuff for pet rescue, black uh, cats and dogs are sometimes less favored for whatever reason. I guess some people think it's not the more interesting coloration, but setting that to one side, okay? This would of course be a fallacious appeal to questionable cause. The person says that this, because this happened first and something else happened afterwards, the two things are connected, but there's no cause and effect there at all. Or if there were, and we could easily induce, you know, tragedy on people by simply letting loose black cats and then watching their lives fall apart after that. That's not how the world really works. Um, or suppose that, you know, you walked along and you stepped on a big heavy crack in the road and then you get a text from your mom or whatever, like later, 30 minutes later, and she says, oh my goodness, I'm in the hospital. I slipped and hurt my back. I think I may have shattered one of my vertebrae. So, you know, the old nursery rhyme, maybe step on a crack, break your mother's back. If you thought that that was the cause of breaking your mother's back, this would again be questionable cause because I mean, if that really did reliably cause the effect, then everyone's mother would have a broken back at some point because of how commonplace it is to simply step on cracks while you walk. Um, here's another one, okay. So I don't know, you guys know a little bit about baseball history. You've heard of the famous baseball player, Babe Ruth, one of the all time you know, greats, I guess, in the Hall of Fame. Um, well, let me get the facts straight. I don't want to misinform you because it's here in the book. <clears throat> okay, so old Babe Ruth, he, uh, <clears throat> he put a curse on the Boston Red Sox in uh, 1920 because the Boston Red Sox sold him to the Yankees and he didn't like being traded. So after that, you know, he says, I'm putting a, an, a curse, an official curse on the, on the you know, Red Sox. Now, um, it, after that, for 84 years, they never won the World Series until finally 2004. It was a very dramatic win, too, because they came back from all the way down. But um, some people said, okay, well, it's Babe Ruth's curse. You know, the curse of Babe Ruth is the reason these guys aren't winning, because he put the curse, and then they stopped winning for 80 years. But obviously, you know, what causes a team to win or lose can't have anything to do with um, a random statement made by a long-gone um, historic baseball player. Um, so anyway, just another example of a questionable cause. So for you to make a claim that cause and effect exists, you have to have very hard and specific evidence that shows that this effect could only have come uh, or could only in all likelihood have come from the stated cause. Um, so we shouldn't get in the habit of just casually and loosely associating uh, events from the past as being a causal basis for events that happen later. Cause and effect is obviously a real thing, but um, when we just assume that something's a cause only because it happened earlier in time, this is questionable, and hence the name of the fallacy. Um, have you ever heard of people who think that if they wear like a lucky outfit or something, that that can affect 
uh, their performance in school or I've even seen people with such superstitions, right, that they love their home team. You know, they cheer for a certain team and they think that if they don't wear like the jersey while the game is being played, then that's going to hurt the team's performance. So um, these are, again, all ways of thinking that are fallacious. These are not logical or reasonable conclusions based on the evidence. One more example from the uh, book. Okay, you guys know Jennifer Lopez, J-Lo, right? Celebrity, actress, singer. Um, so her mom, Guadalupe Lopez, I never knew this until I taught this class, but it's kind of in, in interesting. She actually won $2 million on a slot machine while she was gambling at a casino in Atlantic City, New Jersey. So um, I guess according to her account, right before she pulled the lever for the slot machine, she said like a little good luck prayer to the lady of Guadalupe, like a devotional figure. And um, and to her, she's like, that's the reason that I won the jackpot because of the little good luck charm that I said just before. Now, obviously, look, if there was any cause and effect connection here, then people would be able to always win by saying the same exact words just before playing the slots. And if that was true, then casinos would always lose, the house would lose, they would no longer be profitable, and the whole business would have to be shut down. So obviously, you know, good luck for her that that happened, but it's not necessarily and certainly not due to the reciting of any given words. Um, it's not as though the slot machine can take account of who's playing or what they're saying when they pull these levers. Okay, so questionable cause, there you go, the book. It says, because our brains tend to see order on how we see the world, we may see cause connections in relationships where they don't exist. When a person assumes without sufficient evidence that one thing is the cause of another, the person commits the fallacy of questionable cause. This can happen because we assume that since one event was before the other, that it was the cause of the second event. Sometimes this is also called the post hoc, which means after this in Latin fallacy. Okay, so all clear, no extra questions on that. If so, you can always ask, but if it makes good sense, then we have just a few more to go from here. So questionable cause, hopefully clear. <clears throat> Okay, so next, <clears throat> we have what's called um, slippery slope. So the slippery slope fallacy, um, this is the, um, the false idea that if one type of action is either taken or permitted, that eventually all types of this action will either be taken or permitted. Okay, so the erroneous meaning like, you know, in error, the erroneous assumption that if one type of action is taken or permitted, so the erroneous assumption that if one type of action is taken or permitted, then eventually all actions of this type will be taken or permitted. Okay, so I'll, I'll highlight a couple of important pieces of this. The, the erroneous assumption that if one type of action is taken or permitted, then eventually all actions of this type will be taken or permitted, okay? So um, <clears throat> with Slippery Slope, there's also like a little bit of a backstory about the name, okay? Like I told you guys that with, uh, for example, straw man, you're supposed to think of like a scarecrow made out of straw. That's like not the real argument, but this made up fake version of it. With red herring, I told you that the backstory of that is that people used to train, or they still do train dogs that are hunting dogs with these smelly fish to try and distract them from the scent of the original target that they're, tra that they're tracking. Um, well, Slippery Slope, the name, it calls to mind the image of a person standing atop 
a steep slope, which is slippery. And the idea is that like a person says to them, hey, don't take one step. Don't even take one step on the slope that you're standing atop of because one step on this slippery slope, you're going to lose your footing. And it's not just going to end with one step. It's going to be you're slipping down now the, the hill and you're getting worse and worse injuries as you descend and fall down this hill. So don't even take the one step. It seems like a small step for now, but it won't end there and you'll tumble down the hill and you'll incur further and further and worse and more severe injuries as you go down the hill. So that's like a metaphor in the way of thinking of that as a fallacy. Imagine a person says to you, look, don't even take one action like that because as small as it might seem now, it's putting you on a slippery slope towards this horrible outcome later. Okay. So like um, gateway drug type of argument maybe is one example of slippery slope. Have you ever heard somebody say something like this? Look, don't you ever try even one sip of alcohol. They, they, some people want to experiment when they get to a certain age. But I wouldn't do that because even if you try it once, just a little taste, it's putting you on a slippery slope to becoming a total addict and therefore you'll never be able to pursue your career goals, relationship goals, academic goals. You'll just become a complete um, counterproductive, um, socially useless human being that we all have to take care of. So don't take that one sip unless you want to slide down that slope towards total addiction. Now, obviously, that's probably an overhyped an exaggerated warning of negative things to come on the basis of the one action. So there's not enough evidence, perhaps, that that one action is going to lead to all these further things down the line. Um, I don't know. Sometimes people talk about, you know, in the wake of these types of shootings, like we've seen, unfortunately, this week, last week, um, discussions about gun control get raised. And sometimes people make slippery slope arguments to try and reject the calls for gun control. So they'll say something like this. You know, um, high capacity ammunition magazines and assault weapons, they say, let's try and restrict the sale or the possession of those. But that's putting us on a slippery slope. You know, if we start to restrict the high capacity magazines, the next thing it'll be is that we can't even own weapons. And after a while, they'll confiscate the weapons. And after a while, we won't even live in a free society and we'll be controlled by a total one world government. So don't even allow them to modify slightly the restrictions that we have uh, uh, with respect to firearm ownership. Again, a fallacious slippery slope argument. We know that in many countries where there are much more strict controls on who can own weapons or why, uh, that there's not some kind of dystopian nightmare that people are living through where they don't have any kind of freedom. So that's another example. And I could just keep going on and on, right? Like uh, gay marriage or whatever. Some people might've said, okay, well it's gay marriage today, letting people of the same gender, same sex, whatever, marry each other. But where does it stop? Next thing I could marry, um, you know, my toaster, or I could marry, you know, my refrigerator, just, you know, if we allow, open the door just slightly to new forms of matrimony, uh, it's going to put us on a slippery slope towards a chaotic society where marriage is just, uh, you know, radically detached from even human beings, like people can marry, uh, you know, stuffed animals or something. Once again, it's a slippery slope argument. There's no basis to think that making a slight change in our, you know, cultural understanding of marriage um, that it paves the way towards some kind of nightmarish future status quo. Or let me see if you guys can think of one. Let's not develop this. Um, you know, people are in artificial intelligence labs trying to work on um, work on thinking computers, right? Smart artificial intelligence and AI. Maybe someone says, "Hey, watch out! Don't keep developing AI, because if you build strong AI, what could happen?" According to the slippery slope. Um, reasoning. If we do that, what might happen? What could be the scary warning that warns us off of pursuing artificial intelligence? <clears throat> what do you think could it be? Just to see you apply it to. Oh yeah, there you go, Margarito. That today it's just building, you know, better computer games and better you know, Siri and like uh, voice assistants, you know, Google, um, whatever, and that kind of stuff. But that's opening the door towards what really is going to happen down the line of robots taking over everything, dominating the planet. Then we're going to have, you know, Terminator and stuff. We're going to have to fight back and resist global control by cyborgs. So don't, you know, develop artificial intelligence. Another possible example. Let me see if I've got a few things from the book um, along the same lines. So someone says government bailouts will encourage businesses to take ir irresponsible risks. If we allow them to happen, then soon 
uh, we'll end up having to bail out every business in the nation and then we'll just have communism. You know, I've heard a similar argument given when people talked about expanded unemployment benefits during the pandemic, you know, in the rescue packages that have been passed by both administrations. You know, some people said, uh, well, you know, if you give people such an incentive to not go to work, then they'll never want to work again. And after a while, we're going to no longer have a workforce and we're just going to have to pay people, you know, minimum income and it'll be a socialist society. But obviously that hasn't happened. And if you look at the data, it doesn't show that there's any greater tendency for people to drop out of the workforce when they secure unemployment benefits. Um, here's another example from the book. You know, suppose you had like a little child, a kid, and they're begging their parents to get them a candy bar or something at the store. And one of the parent friends says to that parent, hey, don't give in. Don't listen to the kid. He's going to beg. He's going to scream. He's going to cry. He says, give me the candy bar. I really want it. But if you buy it for him, you know what's going to happen down the line? They're never going to be able to accept no as an answer. They're going to become the kind of people that are just totally spoiled. And then later on in their future as an adult, you know, they're going to be um, completely reckless and irresponsible and they'll do terrible things, maybe even commit crimes. So don't let them have that candy bar. But is it really true that you place the child on a slippery slope towards total irresponsibility and a lack of self-control just because of this one act? Probably not. Um, okay, so... Yeah, so just watch out when, when people try to make exaggerated forecasts of like a really catastrophic result that will happen if one thing is allowed, then you might want to check that against your knowledge of slippery slope and just kind of consider that maybe that is an overhyped and exaggerated state of um, assessing the, the, the risks or fears. <clears throat> Yeah, so carefully carry out your research, familiar, familiarize yourself with the likely outcomes of different actions and policies, and also watch any tendency to exaggerate the forecast of an impending catastrophe. Uh, sometimes advertising and marketing, you will see the slippery slope fallacy. Um, I feel like I remember a commercial from not too long ago, which was for some kind of insurance uh, product. And I think that the advertisement was urging us to buy the insurance because it says like, okay, well, if you don't have whatever it is, Allstate or something, then um, when your car gets a flat, you're not going to have the ability to get it fixed. And if you don't have the ability to get it fixed, then you end up um, having to wait overnight for a tow. And if you have to wait overnight for a tow, someone mugs you. And if they mug you, you lose your wallet. And, and it just goes down this slope of worse and worse results. And in the end, it's like, so therefore, just buy our product. You know, It's kind of like a chain argument that's taking the chain in this really kind of pessimistic, cynical direction but it's not necessarily based on the good evidence that we have. Um, so yeah, just kind of be aware of those things, either in everyday life, our own tendency to do that, or the way that sometimes advertisers and marketers try and uh, imply the same. Okay, so are we all still good, you guys? Um, we are understanding these examples and all that, slippery slope. Um, you know, I remember as a kid, there was this children's story. I'm not sure if it's still out there or if it's something that you guys have ever heard of. But maybe you've heard of this story called If You Give a Mouse a Cookie. And um, I feel like that whole storybook kind of is like an example of the slippery slope fallacy in, in children's literature. Because the plot line is basically like, okay, there's a little cute mouse and the mouse wants a cookie. And you have cookies, so you could give him, a, uh, you could give him some. But if you start off with giving him the one cookie, then it won't stop there. Next time he's going to want two cookies, three cookies. Now he wants a whole box. Now he wants to have his own little area to eat them in. And now, after a while, he wants um, a bigger space in the home uh, to consume these cookies. After a while, now you have to move out into the doghouse or the garage so he can take over the whole home. So it's like he gets increasingly uh, presumptuous about what he's entitled to after you give him that first favor. Now, I'm not sure if I agree with the thought process behind the moral of the story, because what is the moral? When people ask you to do nice things, be skeptical because... It's just going to be that they'll exploit you in the end. Um, I don't know if it's like a warning against generosity, but uh, anyways, just another example that you might be able to relate to. Um, a valid chain argument and an argument with a slippery slope fallacy. Well, the thing is, the slippery slope fallacy in just technical terms could have the form of a valid argument, but it wouldn't be sound is the problem because some of the if-then claims that are found in the premises would not be true conditionals because they would say things like if this happens then that will happen where that specific connection is not actually true in fact in reality so just in technical terms there could be valid arguments of this type but they would be not sound because they would contain false claims of if then 
Dimitri, as a kid, whenever we misbehaved in public, my mom would tell us that a police officer would come and take us away. Well, definitely, you know, that's one of those examples, right? It's like the parent that warns the child, whatever you're doing now, if you continue with that type of behavior, someday you'll be in jail. Someday, you know, you won't have freedom. So they're trying to get you to not do it. But sometimes they may be making an appeal to the slippery slope um, when they think this way or when they argue that way. Of course, they expect, you know, that later on, as you become a full mature adult, you'll be able to see uh, some of the areas where maybe they wanted to just give you enough of an incentive to behave the right way. Um, but, you know, that's why we take these classes as adults and we learn um, you know, how to reason a little bit better. Okay, so slippery slope. We're good. We're done with that, I think. <clears throat> okay, and so then the last one from our whole list, last one to learn, is the naturalistic fallacy. Naturalistic fallacy, okay, so this fallacy basically is the idea, the faulty assumption that whatever must is natural must somehow be good and right. And whatever is in some sense to be described as unnatural has to be something bad and wrong. And that's not just, that's not uh, necessarily true in many cases. So, false assumption that whatever is natural uh, is good and you know side by side with that whatever is unnatural quote unquote is bad Okay, so that's the naturalistic fallacy. Um, suppose, for example, that someone says to you, um, <clears throat> you know, this uh, the cocaine, right, it's a drug that's illegal, but how bad is it really? Because it just grows out of the ground. It's just a plant. You know, God put these plants here. From nature, it's given to us. So it's not something bad because it's given by nature. But obviously, that's a bad argument, okay? Like, cocaine is not good for your health. It's highly addictive. Uh, it's destructive of brain cells and other physiological functions of the body. So just saying, oh, well, it's something that's natural or it can be, therefore it's good. This is not necessarily a good way to argue. So sometimes things that come from nature are not good for you. Like take, for example, hurricanes, uh, tornadoes, earthquakes. They're natural. It's not a man-made thing, but it's not a good thing. We shouldn't hope for another earthquake or a tsunami or something just because it's created by nature. Oftentimes, the story of human beings is our ability to overcome whatever nature has endowed us with so that we can live better and have a better, um, you know, survival as, as a species. Um, so if you really have a problem with things that are not natural, then you should stop driving your car. You should stop even using this computer because none of these things are found in the state of nature, right? This is not stuff that grows on trees. This computing technology, these telecommunications, uh, transportation systems, and so on and so forth. They're not found in nature, but that doesn't mean that they're bad or that they're something that's not valuable. Um, so oftentimes things that are <clears throat> not natural can be good, and sometimes things that are natural can be bad. Like, I mean, do you really want to roll around in poison ivy just because it's a plant that grows out of the ground? That's going to be bad for your skin, and that's going to cause damage. So um, you have to look at a case-by-case -case basis to see whether something claimed to be natural or unnatural has either value or, in some cases, lacks value or is bad. Um, like, I don't know, the textbook gives the example of those that sometimes make the argument that, you know, uh, procreation is the natural function of human beings, you know, in our, our biological sex organs and stuff. So therefore, uh, same-sex couples that can't possibly procreate naturally must be doing something wrong. You know, if it's out of order with what nature designed or something, then that must be wrong. But look, human beings have freedom and they have will and they have choice. So just because something's not as nature intended doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to conduce to any harm or that it's something that's wrong. Um, do you feel that natural things are bad? Then maybe you shouldn't take medicine. Maybe you shouldn't take a vaccine. Now, that's another one, right? People make this specific naturalistic fallacy argument. These vaccines are bad. They don't grow on trees. They're built in a lab. You know, so this kind of man-made technology, this interference with nature, playing God or whatever, it can't be good. But necessarily, that's not true. I mean, um, vaccines have made our lives much better and more safe 
polio vaccine that was introduced about 100 years ago has really revolutionized public health in the world. And the coronavirus vaccine that's being uh, widely distributed now is certainly something that we're happy to have because otherwise, you know, with unchecked spread of the virus and no means to counteract its effects, you know, we would see a much more substantial death toll and no ability to return to normal even in the long term. Um, so, you know, whether it's uh, a person claiming that those things that are natural have to be good, even if it's like dangerous or destructive, or those things that are unnatural have to be bad, even if they're beneficial or suitable to our needs. This is not necessarily a good argument, and you have to really look at things from a case-by-case -case basis. Some things that are natural are good, and some things that are unnatural are bad for you too, but we can't just look at it as a blanket statement in every single case. Uh, so you say, Yvonne, so anything synthetic or semi-synthetic is unnatural. Yeah, I mean, the word itself, I mean, philosophically, we could get into a deeper discussion of how to define the word natural or not, because arguably, even if we build like atomic weapons and stuff, it's something that human beings do and we're just a life form. When we see honeybees building a, a, a beehive or a honeycomb, we don't say the honeycomb is not natural because they had to build it. Um, so human beings with our higher level of intelligence, yeah, we create technology, we create, you know, architecture, art. Um, and therefore, I almost feel like the distinction between the natural and the unnatural is, is poorly stated and it's not definite. But I would agree with you, Yvonne, don't want to belabor the point too much, that overall people think of things that are natural as things that didn't have anything to do with the operation of human beings. So just it's found in the world, in the state of nature. Suppose there were no human beings anymore. Natural stuff is whatever would be happening then, I guess. But I mean, we're, we're living things too, right? So I mean, whatever we end up doing, I don't see how that can't be considered an extension of human nature, but, but I digress. I mean, so anyway, yeah, uh, in the book, let me give a few other examples or just read from it. It says, the naturalistic fallacy is based on the unwarranted assumption that what is, what is natural is good or morally acceptable, and what is unnatural is bad or morally unacceptable. Um, we find this fallacy in arguments that claim that no good could come from artificial intelligence simply on the grounds that it doesn't come from nature. Advertisers, there's another one, okay? So let me take a moment to mention that. Advertisers and marketers, this is a common source of the naturalistic fallacy because a lot of these you know, uh, companies, they know that people have a, a preference for things that are somehow described as being more natural. So a lot of times, you know, food products and things, they'll, they'll be sure to label the product in such a way as organic, green, not GMO. Um, and sometimes even dangerous and destructive products will try and make an appeal to the naturalistic fallacy. So like some cigarette companies, they'll say all natural tobacco organically grown as if that somehow changes its destructive and harmful properties like having carcinogens and tar. Um, so yeah, just know that. And it says that in the book, advertisers may try to get us to conclude that their product is good or healthy simply because it's natural. An ad can claim, for example, that a tobacco product is 100% natural tobacco. However, it doesn't follow that tobacco is good for us. All tobacco is natural, but that doesn't make it healthy. Arsenic, HIV, tsunamis are also natural, but we don't think that they're healthy and we don't desire them. The naturalistic fallacy has also been used to justify um, Wait, sorry, uh, to, to claim that um, it is immoral to be gay, as in the following. Gay encounters don't lead to children, which is the natural goal of sexual relations. Therefore, it's immoral. In a similar manner, a person may argue that hunting is morally acceptable because other animals hunt and kill. You know, I've heard that argument, too. Like, don't tell me there's anything wrong with consuming meat or, you know, even hunting animals because in nature, other animals are predatory and they also hunt. But, again, that's just saying that because that's something that's found in nature, that it's something that's morally or socially desirable for us human beings, which requires a separate argument. Um, obviously, if we did everything that the animals did, we would do a lot of bad things because, you know, like there's no such concept as consent or whatever when it comes to animal sexual relations. So we can't model the appropriate behavior of people on what we think animals do. Not to say there's anything wrong with eating meat or whatever, but that might not be the right way of defending it, just saying it's somehow natural. Um, and it says that in the book, the fact that other animals are predators does not justify our doing the same. Some animals eat their young, a few female insects eat their male partners after mating, but these naturally occurring examples don't imply that it is somehow justifiable for humans to do the same. So um, in the end, we've learned about a lot of different fallacies here. So you can see in the text, they talk at the end about strategies for avoiding fallacies, and I'll just mention a few of them as I'm passing through it. Know yourself, 
Um, know which fallacies you're most likely to fall for and which ones you're more likely to commit and try to counteract the tendency to either be uh, susceptible to such arguments or to be uh, given to them yourself. Have good confidence and self-esteem. If you have that, then it'll make you less uh, inclined to resort to fallacious arguments because you'll know um, that you can stand on your own reasoning. And it'll also make you less likely to go for things like popular appeal um, because you will be more comfortable expressing your own views, even if they differ from other people. Listen carefully to other people. Be respectful and listen to them, even if you don't agree. Don't always be focused and obsessed with winning. Sometimes wanting to win the argument, no matter what, is what causes you to commit these fallacies. Because instead of conceding a point or thinking about the issue a little differently, you resort to whatever kind of available reasoning you might have, including logically fallacious reasoning. Um, watch your body language. Sometimes we commit fallacies also in the way that we uh, project the message to other people. So um, a message can seem more or less threatening, for example, given the body language or tone of voice that delivers it. Um, know your topic. Don't jump to a conclusion without doing a little research um, and be willing and comfortable to tell people that there's maybe some things that you don't know that you have to look into a little bit more deeply. And um, try to use language clearly. You know, don't speak ambiguously or use uh, ambiguous terms or grammar. And then um, just don't attack the person. Don't confuse the argument the person is giving with their character. Sometimes people argue poorly and sometimes they hold views that you just don't agree with, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're a bad human being or that they're irredeemable. So we should always try to see through and to the common humanity of other people. Even when we argue, when we dispute, as we may, as we should, uh, we should try always to keep in mind that that's a human being that we're talking with and that we should still respect them at the end of the day. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I think we've kind of covered all the stuff that I really wanted to go through when it came to all these different fallacies. Um, and I know we have our spring break coming up, so it wouldn't bother me really if we closed the class a little bit earlier than normal, just to kind of give you some extra time free. Uh, what do you guys think about that? Let me know if that sounds good. Then maybe just in this one occasion, we'll have a little bit of a shorter meeting and I'll be in touch from here um, as the days and weeks go on as we get back towards the end of spring break. So just let me see how you feel about that. <clears throat> okay, good, thank you, Margarito. Um, I'll try to send off some way of reviewing the different fallacies too in the days leading up to the um, return from spring break so that you have even more review notes available. Um, but I guess then that's pretty much it. You know, I, I wanted to devote en enough attention to all the fallacies, but I think um, no need to just go back over it since you have the videos themselves. You can use those as well for your review. So then, um, all right, guys, perfect. Well, thanks again. Now, don't forget your, your second homework is due no later than midnight on Friday, so you still have a, a little bit of time, a couple days. Um, send me that whenever you can, and I'll just grade it over the break, and I'll send the answer key this weekend so that you know what the right answers would have been. And um, I'm still going through the responses to the emails about the midterms. I've almost finished all those that I got on Monday, but a couple more uh, I have to still finish. Yes, just send it to my email. That's right, Danny. So send it to rvulich at fullerton.edu. Use your Outlook email account to send it. Don't do it through Titanium or well, we don't even use Canvas, so that's not an option, but just email it to me. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so perfect then. Thanks, guys. Have a great one. And, uh, again, if you need anything, just let me know. If you're still looking for scores or anything else, please email me about it, and I'll be in touch. Okay, then have a great one, and um, have a good spring break, and I'll see you guys in a bit once we get back, a couple weeks. All right, thank you. Bye-bye.